Good afternoon. Game day. Hugely exciting. Collingwood and Melbourne. The one-trick pies, according to Ed Langdon tonight. Isn't that going to add a bit of a spice? Having said that, every time we ask players for an honest answer and they give one, we criticise them. So good on Ed. I like him. He's a good player. But uh, just for some context there, in an interview this week, Langdon reckons the Pies are one-trick ponies in some regards, and they think they can exploit that tonight. We'll find out. A huge, huge 24 hours of news. Yesterday, I flew to the Gold Coast and back to speak to Gil McLaughlin regarding Eddie Betts, and this is what Gil had to say to me in somewhat of a landmark uh, interview in many respects, offering an uh, apology to Eddie Betts in regards to the Crows camp. Gil, Eddie Betts has issued an impassioned plea for the AFL to say sorry in regards to the pain and hurt caused in relation to the camp. What's the AFL's position on that? Clearly we're sorry to Eddie and anyone who's, who's uh, of course, suffering from that camp. And we, you know, we've certainly seen today how much it hurt Eddie. And frankly, some of the stuff that went on was a, was a disgrace. And clearly, uh, you know, we, we're hearing him and hear his pain and we're sorry. Gil, what initiatives has the AFL taken since the camp to ensure that this will not happen again? Well, um, first of all, there is every pre-season camp um, since that Adelaide camp has to be signed off by the AFL and authorised and all, everything that's going on to ensure that the mental health and physical health and well-being of all the participants. Um, I've, for, for some time now, been in, in regular contact uh, with via conferences with our Indigenous male players, and we started that with our Indigenous female players uh, last week, actually, our first meeting with them. And you know, uh, uh, you know, through that, it was clear that we needed um, uh, Indigenous representation uh, at all clubs, looking after the health and welfare of the players, and that's why we have got uh, Indigenous liaison officers at all 18 clubs, and that was clearly uh, from feedback from the players, and it's because of incidents like this. So just as some context, Gill had been on the Gold Coast at Kingscliff for an AFL corporate partners conference, and I spoke to him, flew up there and spoke to him at Surface Paradise Airport late yesterday, just before the news. So that's uh, what Gill's had to say in regards to the Eddie Betts situation overnight. Buddy Franklin, according to a Nine News Brisbane report last night, has informed the Swans that he won't be playing in Sydney next year and is interested in more premierships and Brisbane shapes as the most appropriate destination, according to Buddy, according to this report. The report also uh, said that uh, the Lions and Franklin were already in discussions. Now, Brisbane responded by saying in part that uh, if he wants to move to Queensland, they'd be happy to have a chat. And Sydney, Tom Harley speaking on radio last night, Sports Today, said that the report was, quote, news to him, unquote, Jared Healy reporting that. Now, in terms of the latest this morning, Chris Fagan has spoken at his weekly press conference and in part said if Buddy was moving to Queensland next year, to me that suggests he's going to retire. I'll break down what Chris says on 7 News tonight. But just to break this all down... Um, if Brisbane was to get Buddy Franklin, obviously they'd add Hipwood, Danaher and Buddy up forward. That's if, if, if. It's a big if. Um, from Sydney's perspective, I think this is all news to them. Um, they're continuing to work towards a deal with Buddy. They want Buddy next year. They think that Buddy wants to be there next year at the Swans and they're trying to work towards a deal. They love Buddy Franklin. Having said all this, the mature aspect to all this discussion, of course, is that Sydney have a lot of players they need to recontract. They can only afford to pay the market value under their salary cap for Buddy Franklin. That is based on his playing ability. Of course, Buddy's got the ability to put bums on seats, but I don't know if you can factor that in. I mean, Sydney can only play, pay players based on their uh, what they're worth from a footy perspective, if you like. It's not some type of uh, Buddy show just up forward. It's based on his performance, clearly. Um, and what they think he can add in in that regard. Sydney want to do a deal with Buddy Franklin, and I think privately are a bit sort of bemused by all this external chatter. Not necessarily surprised, but bemused. I mean, if Buddy, who's a you know big boy, wants to go and play the final year of his career elsewhere, I'm sure Sydney and Buddy could amicably work through that. That's certainly my impression. But the Swans want him next year. They're working towards a contract for next year. There's obviously a difference on the money, which uh, I think Robbo and the Herald Sun reported recently. It's speculation on the difference, but it's somewhere... Um, where Buddy wants about 750000 and Sydney is offering in the vicinity of five hundred. Usually in negotiations, you end up meeting in the middle, but this is the situation. There's obviously a broad discussion. Does Buddy Franklin owe Sydney? He's been on, I think, the biggest contract in the history of football for the best part of nine years. In one of those seasons, didn't play any games at all. So is it sort of, for want of a better term, hospitable or ideal going to play a final year elsewhere? 
Well, perhaps not, but I don't think it'll defend Sydney. You know, Buddy's entitled to do what he wants to do if he wants to indeed move to a warmer climate. Having said that, Sydney love Buddy and want him to be there next year. So I think that's where the situation sits. Of course, it's a big story. It involves Buddy Franklin. Would it be a shock if he moved to another club next year? I personally don't think so. It might work for Sydney and it might work for Buddy. But at the moment, I think Sydney's still quietly optimistic. They'll work towards getting a agreeable deal done for next year. If that doesn't happen, then I guess he'll move clubs. Brody Grundy, it doesn't look like we'll play in the VFL this weekend. Um, I've been told this week that his ankle isn't good, and it's my understanding, reading between the lines from some sources, that he has been seeing specialists in that regard, and they're working out the best plan for him to get back to footy this year. So it doesn't sound good concerning his ankle. It also seems now that it was a separate issue to the knee that uh, occurred lately in regards to this ankle, some type of impingement or um, sort of like a grumbly ankle is the way it was described to me. And he's been getting advice on that this week. So hopefully Brody's back for the finals. He won't play this VFL this weekend, but I have been told in a bit of a concern that his ankle isn't good. Now, beyond that, I don't have any further details. I know he's seen specialists this week and they're trying to work through that and a plan in the background to get Brody playing hopefully in the finals this year. Alastair Clarkson is currently weighing up a... Uh, offer from North Melbourne and huge interest from the Giants. It's clearly his role at North if he wants it. They're prepared and are putting aside their process in a bid to get Alastair Clarkson. They want to exhaust all potential opportunities. A broader discussion has been whether Clarko can get any ambassador money to push the money up over and above the amount that he'd get under the soft cap. Gil McLaughlin addressed this, this issue on 3AW this morning and said that it's not going to be part of the deal. There's no specific ambassador money where the AFL would team up with one of those clubs for it. But I did detect a slight softening in his position insofar as later on, Alistair could apply for some um, program money if he was doing something through the multicultural space or a geographical ambassador space. For example, this year he's been doing um, the coaching ambassador program for community footy for the AFL. So could he get some extra money that way? Look, he wouldn't have a lot of time if he was a full-time coach but perhaps. Anyway, have a listen to what Gil McLaughlin said on this issue this morning. Uh, they they can get them, but not in you know in the lead into an, an agreement. So, and this is the same with play. You know, there are you know we need our coaches and players to market products, parts of the code, and whatever. But they are never part of the agreement. So, if, if you're talking to Alistair Clarkson, he will not be able to bank on in deals with North Melbourne or GWS or whoever, whoever he might be talking to. This is a hypothetical. I don't know that he is or he is. Well, I'm not commenting on that. Other than to say, he has to make his decision on the on the terms offered to him within the salary cap within the within that framework. So that was Gill on that this morning. It doesn't sound like, uh, it certainly doesn't sound like the AFL will team up with North or the Giants and guarantee a separate amount of money. Having said that, like the 18 or so best players in the competition and like the coaches, it would be open to them to look at that deal, some type of deal in the future. But it doesn't sound like Clarkson could bank on that, at least initially. Just some brief ones. Dyson Heppel, certainly no guarantee he'll be at the Bombers next year. The situation, as I see it, is that the Bombers are offering about a year. And if Dyson was to get two years at, for example, and this is hypothetical, the Gold Coast or North Melbourne, I guess he'd be duty-bound to consider that. So there, that's what's working through at the moment. Um, an interesting discussion point there would be whether, in this current landscape, you could do a farewell game uh, at Essendon, uh, and then Dyson could say, look, I've identified an alternative opportunity. I can't go into that at this stage, but my time at Essendon's been wonderful. Uh, let's celebrate this final game, and then, now, then I'm going to move on. Look, that's all hypothetical at this stage. I think the Bombers would certainly like him to play the next year, but there's no guarantee on how many games he'd play. Might be 8, 10, 12, 14 games. Might be 22 or 23 if they have some injuries. But I don't know if he'd be a permanent part of the team next year. Um, he certainly would be in theory, but other guys might go beyond him. Um, so it's an interesting discussion that's going on in the background at the moment. Essendon in the vicinity of off, well, certainly prepared to offer a year. But the question then becomes whether one of the expansion clubs or clubs that want his leadership would offer him a more certain two years. So if he could get, say, hypothetically, for $400,000 a year from the Gold Coast or North Melbourne, that'd be an $800,000 deal where Essendon might only be in a position to offer him in a year at, say, for example, 300000 which is a hypothetical figure. So that's up to Dyson and his partner to consider. He's an Essendon great. He's been through a lot. Would it take anything away from his period at Essendon if he played another year or two elsewhere? Probably not. I mean, Jordan Lewis is regarded clearly as a Hawthorne legend. Um, Dyson would be obviously a, an Essendon great. Um, so, you know, there's, these types of things can happen, but uh, that's what's going on at the moment. 
Just one for Carlton fans. Michael Voss has reiterated today there's no certainty that George Hewitt with his persistent sort of mysterious back injury will play again this year. He just can't get it right. So that's a potential blow for the Blues and for Hewitt, one of their key recruits. Dave Matthews, the Giants boss, I understand, has been interviewed as part of the process for Gil McLaughlin's job. It's obviously a broad field where Travis Old and Andrew Dillon from the AFL are the favourites. But Dave Matthews, I'm told this week, has been interviewed for that. It's funny. They did psychometric testing, and there's a school of thought that one of the questions was, what sort of tree would you be? I'm not sort of, I'm not sure what sort of tree Dave Matthews would be. I haven't uh, given that too much thought, but uh, it would be an interesting response. Perhaps uh, something durable in the desert or something. I'm not too sure. But uh, Gil McLaughlin was asked that question this morning and said he liked red gum. So I'm not a tree expert, but uh, an interesting, quirky one. I'm not even sure they even asked that as part of the process. But it's been written up in the paper this week. And just finally also, there's been a uh, bit of a shake-up at the AFL regarding the community umpiring department recently. They're looking to sort of change the structure of that under the new umpiring boss. Brenton Sanderson has been working in at the AFL, not in a huge role, but in the community umpiring role. And some of those changes do affect Sanderson, I'm led to believe, uh, who I think might even look at uh, returning, hopefully, to coaching or assistant coaching next year. But just some changes in the community umpiring department at the AFL. A massive, massive weekend of football. It all kicks off Melbourne and Collingwood on Triple M tonight. Dars will be on tonight as well. It'll be intriguing to see and hear from Dars on Sam making his much-anticipated debut this weekend. Can't wait to hear from Dars in regards to that topic. It's going to be a massive, massive weekend of football. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast during the week. A significant apology from Gil McLaughlin to Eddie Betts, which we had last night and obviously on the podcast today. Triple M rocks football. That was Tom Brown's news. Come back every Monday, Thursday and Friday for more and subscribe to Triple M Footy on Listener or wherever you listen to get all our podcasts throughout the season. For Ream Hot Water and McDonald's, Triple M rocks footy.